Good morning, everyone, and I'd like to greet you in the name of the Lord. It's a virtual greeting. As I walked down the hallway of our church, I stopped for a few moments and looked at the pictures of everyone who isn't here this morning, and that's everyone. And so I'd like to give you all a virtual hug. Uh, Pastor John, who usually does this, uh, had some personal problems to attend to this week, uh, so I have the duties. Uh, before I get started, I would like to say a few things about uh, the future. Um, I'd like to speak to our church members and our congregation and say that at the end of April, the church leadership is going to meet to discuss what things are going to look like moving forward. Um, the state is going to be transition, transitioning from phase zero, which we're in now, to phase one, which is not much different than phase zero. And so the church is going to have to operate under uh, state, federal, local guidelines as far as social distancing, as far as size of gatherings, etc. So uh, changes in the worship service will be inevitable. What those changes will look like exactly, I don't know. There may be a series of small group meetings or, or things like that, but we will keep you informed. But I would like to say that we as a church will be following those guidelines that are issued uh, by the authorities. Uh, we don't intend on defying them and doing things that uh, we're told not to do. Uh, however, I'm very confident God in his word said, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. So um, if we can't do it physically, we can certainly do it in spirit. And I believe God will make a way. And so with that, the message this morning is going to be how Christians should act during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that in spirit your word go forth touching the hearts and minds of those listening, uh, making things clear as to our behavior uh, during this time of crisis and unknown um, and, and facing so many unknowns. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. Life is a little different for me now, and I'm sure it's a little different for you than it was just a few weeks ago. My wife buys toilet paper online. Um, for a while, she was afraid if she bought it at the store that there would be a toilet paper snatcher um, grab it from her cart as she walked to the car. It's uh, certainly different times. There's no more hugs. There's no more handshakes. We look around nervously at someone who is not six feet away. Most of us, I believe, like me, are probably watching the news. I will generally switch between CNN and Fox and try to get a better picture of what's going on um, and what the impact of COVID-19 is going to be to me and to our nation. Some of the things I have learned from TV are very confusing. For instance, we hear that we need more tests. How many more? Somewhere between 100 and 100 million. Big decision. I learned that I may have already had the virus, which means one of two things. I might be immune or it can still kill me. I have learned that businesses may soon begin to open, but customers may or may not be allowed to shop. There's a few things I've read on the internet. One was that caught my eye, Christians are defying guidelines. 
and gathering in churches in large groups because they want to die and go to heaven. Now, I do want to go to heaven. I will probably get there, as most of us will, by dying, but not by suicide. I read that the constant washing of hands with antibiotic soap is creating super bacteria that are immune to antibiotics. For most of us, this may be some of the most impactful moments of our entire lives. A time filled with unknowns. And unknowns can be very scary. What's out there? The future we envisioned just a few weeks ago has probably changed. And now it's clouded. It's clouded with doubts. It's clouded with fear and with uncertainty. And COVID-19 is doing what wars, depressions, natural disasters have not done. By shutting down places of worship for Christians over the entire world. Over Easter, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem was closed to the public. The last time it was closed for a sustained period was during the Black Plague in the 14th century. And so the question now becomes, what are Christians to do during this unprecedented time? How are we to think? Uh, how are we to behave? We're living in circumstances that are so totally different and totally foreign to us. I have good news. And I got it from the good news book. The Bible, God's Word, is not lacking in guidance to navigate us through this crisis. God is sufficient, and God's Word is sufficient. It was sufficient before COVID-19. It is sufficient during COVID-19, and it will be sufficient after COVID-19 is long gone. Let me read just one of hundreds of verses given to guide us in exactly times like these. It's so well known from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in everything you do, and he will show you what path to take. Actually, for Christians, how to live in the middle of a pandemic, how to live during a crisis like this is really quite simple. We continue to do the things that we have always done. That's it. That's it. But maybe we do them a little more. We love a little more. We give a little more. We care a little more. We pray a little more. And so we can begin with Christ's basic teachings. What are they? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That can apply while you're walking around Walmart looking at the bare shelves and trying to find that last roll of paper towels or the last pound of hamburger. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, do unto others and love your as you'd have them do unto you and love your neighbor as yourself. Those were verses that we lived by before. COVID-19, and we live by them during COVID-19, and so we'll live by them after the pandemic is over. It's easy to live and to know what to do as a Christian during this time of crisis because basically we do what we have always done or what we have always done supposed to do. During the crisis, 
I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed, a lot of people have had the tendency to grab for the last package of paper towels or the last pound of that hamburger I was talking about or the last bottle of sanitizer. And some of us may be tempted to even hoard items. Uh, we should not. This historic calamity for the Christian is such an enormous opportunity to show the love of God in such very real and practical ways as we could never do before. Churches across the country are not running away from the nation's pain, but they're leaning into it. They're collecting surgical masks. They're reallocating significant sums of money for COVID-19 relief. They're hiring laid off restaurant workers to make meals for the unemployed. They're opening their facilities to be used by the cities in any way they choose. They're buying tablets to be used by children of low income families for distance learning. And they're doing a thousand other things that we see every day on the news. And they're doing all of this in a way that respects social distancing and other government guidelines issued to slow the spread of the virus and save lives. I've noticed myself that those here at Heritage are calling one another more. They're checking up on each other. Is there anything I can do to help? I was thinking about you today and thought I would call. I'm praying for you. And many of our people have become involved in charitable activities designed to help those most in need. And then the Bible says we're not to worry. We're to pray more. We're to stay in the Word more. And so another very beautiful passage from Philippians 4, 6 and 4, 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and guard your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. What's a guarded heart or a guarded mind? I was thinking about that, and I was thinking when I get excited, how my heart beats and thumps. There have been times when I thought it would come out of my chest. Those were times when the peace of God was absent. And a guarded mind, how about your thoughts? We have this tendency for thoughts to run amok in our minds and, and pull us in a hundred different directions at once. A guarded mind is sensible and focused and almost always continually communing with God. Let's not forget the fact that even though we are not at church, that shouldn't keep us from being the church. Do the other people around us look at us and see people who are fearful and worried? Is that what they see? Or people at peace, confident, confident in God's care, confident in God's outcome. But I'm not so naive, I'm not so naive as not to realize that this pandemic is presenting us with choices that we may not have faced before, will never face again. Choices that we have never even thought about. In this time of church closure, pastors are having a difficult time. They're struggling with things like how to maintain unity in the body, how to meet individual needs of their congregation, how to teach and instruct and encourage 
how to conduct communion and baptisms and do all the things that pastors are expected to do. One pastor lamented, I feel like I'm hand handing out life jackets of hope in a sea of despair. And so we must continually ask ourselves, here's a good question, do we have confidence and trust in what this book says? Because when we are sure of what the Bible says we are to do, we will better be prepared to identify those things during this crisis we are not to do. And believe me, there are things we should be doing and there are things we should not be doing. Which brings me to a second question. How are we to deal with this ever-changing um, arena of regulation and guidelines issued by our leaders that have made so many people prisoners in their own homes, that have taken away jobs and livelihoods and left us with uncertain futures? Does God in His Word tell us how we are to relate to the governing authorities? And the answer is a resounding yes. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Please listen closely. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against God, what God has instituted, and they will be punished. Simply put, we are to obey, uh, obey our leaders. God knows what he's doing. For me, it's kind of like this. I look at our leaders and I think, do I trust them? And I don't even want to answer that question because I trust entirely the God who placed them there. I don't have to decide if I trust them or not. I have to decide, do I trust the God who put them there? Sadly, at the beginning of the pandemic, some churches, for whatever reasons, decided to defy the national guidelines for social distancing and size of gathering. This resulted in several instances where church gatherings became the source of COVID-19 spread. They became hot spots and they put many people at risk. A Virginia pastor defying state and federal guidelines boasted of his open doors and packed pews. I firmly believe that God is larger than this dreaded virus. And you can quote me on this, he preached. He went on and vowed to his congregation that he would keep the doors open no matter what. Of himself, he said this, I am essential. I am a preacher. And I talk to God. This pastor died on the Saturday before Easter of COVID-19 complications. And on Easter Sunday, the church issued this statement. On April 11th at 9 p.m., our pastor transitioned from labor to reward. The pastor believed God is bigger than any sickness or disease, and rightly so. I have read of people with stage 4 cancer given weeks to live who are now walking around completely cured. God is bigger than any sickness or disease. But what this pastor seemingly failed to believe with the same degree of trust was God's instructions that we obey the governing authorities in all things. Things that are not contrary to the Holy Scriptures and the Spirit's leading. 
The word of God is to be taken to heart and believed in its entirety. We are not to pick and choose out the things we want and the things we want to follow. This is our complete authority, the entire book. Jesus lived life under Roman authority in such a way that the Roman governor Pilate found no cause to condemn him at his trial. Jesus paid his taxes. He taught others to give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what's God. He went on and he said, be the best citizen you can under Roman rule. He said, if a soldier, and, and this was a law, if a soldier asked you to carry his armor and knapsack for a mile, Jesus said, carry it too. Be the best citizens there are. The Apostle Paul in the verses above was writing to the Corinthians to Christians living in, in Rome. I'm sorry, to the Christians living in Rome. And telling them to be good citizens, even under the cruelty of Emperor Nero. And even under the face of persecution. We as Christians ought to be law-abiding citizens. Examples to those who are watching our every move. And believe me, we are being watched. We should go the speed limit. A ah, little pang of something there. Maybe guilt. We should pay our taxes. And during this pandemic, we need to social distance, avoid large gatherings, and wear our masks in public according to the established guidelines given to us by our leaders. In so doing, we glorify God. And we are examples to those around us. And then, we as Christians should part... Oh, a question. Should we as Christians participate in the protest rallies that have begun to spring up around the nation. I believe some of the guidelines that have been put forth like you don't buy paint and you can't buy the American flag by some of our leaders are unnecessary. Some of them are on the verge of ridiculous. But the way Christians are to protest, and we're allowed to protest, should not entail breaking the social distancing guidelines set by those in authority. We are not to put others in danger of contracting this virus. If I'm to protest, I can write letters. I can write letters to the paper to the elected officials. I can organize legal opposition. But most of all, I can vote. And then today there are some high profile Christian leaders who presume that they can divine, interpret the message God is sending the world through this pandemic. Some say it's a warning to a world steeped in sin and perversion. Some are saying it's a warning to a church that has become lukewarm and is about to be spit out. Others are taking a more extreme view, declaring the pandemic to be the beginning of the end with greater terrors to come. I just read this morning a very well-known evangelist declared that God will continue striking us with this virus as long as we continue to allow same-sex marriages and other perversions in our nation. Speaking for myself, and now I am speaking for me. The peace and the comfort I talked about earlier, I have found 
in a great sense by avoiding, avoiding the why question. For me, God is on his throne from which he rules this world. A sparrow cannot fall without his approval. The world over the centuries has endured much suffering through natural disasters, famines, plagues. But from the dawn of creation, it has been God's desire that none should perish and that all should come to repentance. God is indeed on his throne. He indeed has an answer as to why the coronavirus, why this COVID-19. And here's what I know. I know that at the core of that answer, at the core of the answer to the question, why this coronavirus? God's answer, at the core of God's answer, is love. Love for every individual on the face of this earth, right at this moment. And at the core of that love is his desire that none should perish that all come to repentance. So why the coronavirus? It has something to do with love. You say, well, what about punishment? Punishment can be love. Correction can be love. The answer, the core of this is love. So for wise Christians, my prayer this morning is simply this. Let us emerge from this pandemic as different and better people. More kind. More generous. More able to mourn with those who mourn, more able to distribute mercy as mercy is distributed to us, more able to live without fear, knowing love casts out fear, more able to present a living and loving Christ to such a needy world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to reach out to those who cannot be here in person. I thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. And Father, I would pray that from this message, our people, your people, would open their eyes to the needs of those around us, to the many things they might be doing or could do to present the gospel in word, in action, to everyone who is suffering through this pandemic. And Lord, I lean on you, I trust you, I have no fear or worry, for at the center of everything you do is your love for me and for all mankind. And so I give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.